Welcome to Free Thought Matters. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. And I'm Dan Barker. We are the co-presidents of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, which produces this weekly talk show, a talk show for the rest of us, atheists, agnostics, non-believers, and others who do believe in the constitutional principle of the separation between state and church. We invite you to join our group today, or you can simply ask for a sample of our newspaper, Free Thought Today, at FFRF.org. Our theme today is secular activism. We'll be talking with two brave, dedicated individuals who have taken and won lawsuits over censorship of non-religious points of view by our government. Each of them is being named a Freethinker of the Year by the Freedom From Religion Foundation, which is an award honoring state church plaintiffs. In a minute, we're going to meet the man who has the most famous license plate in the world. Ben Hart is a feisty freethinker with a fun sense of humor who just won a lawsuit in his state of Kentucky. And then on the second half of today's show, we're going to talk with a Florida activist, David Williamson, who runs the Freedom From Religion Foundation's chapter in Central Florida and was a key plaintiff in a major case that FFRF won against county censorship of non-religious invocations. And we have Ben Hart with us now. Welcome to Free Thought Matters, Ben. Well, thank you very much for having me. And first, I, I think that you won't mind if I give away that you're an octogenarian. That's true. So how long have you been an atheist? Well, uh, about 66 years. Since a teenager then, wow. Right, when I was 15. So your legal saga really started when you were living in Ohio, where the license plates unfortunately carry this religious slogan, One Nation Under God. So can you tell us what bothered you about having that on your license plate and how you decided to fight back? Well, I uh, originally uh, wanted something that was unique uh, for a, a license plate, so I thought, well, let's try for I'm God. Hmm. And I applied for it, and I got it, and it was no problem. And then uh, when I moved to uh, Kentucky, uh, I asked uh, for the same plate uh, in Kentucky, and uh, I received a letter uh, back saying it was denied because it was obscene and vulgar. That's when I contacted uh, uh, Freedom From Religion Foundation, and uh, they wrote them a letter, and um, they said, well, it's not obscene and vulgar, but it's uh, distracting. So, uh, and I think anyway, also, Ben, didn't they say it wasn't in good taste? That was the second one thing. They said it wasn't, uh, it was not in good taste, too. And so it's my understanding that there's all kinds of religious personalized license plates that other people in Kentucky have been allowed to order for their license plates. Is that right? That's true. That's true. There's quite a few of them. So, how did that make you feel to be discriminated against? Well, uh, I figured, well, it, this, is a, this is a job for Freedom From Religion Foundation. Mm -hmm. That's when I contacted you folks. And um, we contacted the state of Kentucky, and they just uh, refused to move on it. So you folks uh, got a hold of the American Civil Liberties Union in Kentucky, and uh, they agreed to take the case. Yeah, we, well, we took the case together, but they carried most of it. And you were our very important plaintiff. And this case, I believe, began in, was it 2016? Yes, November 2016. So justice moves slowly. <laughs> Very. So, so uh, uh, the lawsuit was uh, in federal court. And uh, when did you win that case? It was uh, three years later uh, on, uh, in November of uh, 2019. Um, the state of Kentucky, after six months, had filed for a, an extension or a, a dismissal. And, uh, and it sat on the judge's desk for a year uh, before he ruled on it. And uh, he finally ruled on it that it was going to go to court. And uh, that's, uh, that's when it all uh, started coming around together. But it took a while before you actually got the license plate. I think that was in February 2020, and there was a little hitch, wasn't there? Uh, yes, I had ordered uh, the plate with In God We Trust on it, 
And uh, when I went to pick it up, it didn't have it on there. So I told him uh, I refused it and said I wanted In God We Trust on the plate. So the next week, uh, they told me my plate was in, and I went and got it, and it had In God We Trust on it. So you wanted, and, to, you wanted to make a point. The state has In God We Trust. The state has in God we trust, and you wanted to say, I'm God. So without that, it wouldn't have had the same impact, would it? No, no, no. I don't think it would have. So you now have, I think you've told us, you have uh, the most expensive license plate in the world. Is that how you put it? Uh, well, it's the most expensive license plate in the country. Some guy in Saudi Arabia paid $14 million for the numeral one. Uh. Oh, really? You've researched so, this. <laughs> <laughs> I decided that, uh, well, at least uh, I think I have the most expensive plate in the country. But you didn't have to pay for that. Why is it expensive? Well, the state of Kentucky had to pay for it. They paid $150,000 in attorney's fees. To deny you your freedom of expression. Right. It cost them. So you've got two license plates now, one from Ohio, one that you use in Kentucky. But both of them have religious mottos on them. And both of these mottos uh, are mottos that you didn't grow up with, correct? Because um, we didn't have In God We Trust as a national motto until, until the 1950s. 50s, that's right. Isn't that right? That's true. And then you would have... Uh, I have the, uh, uh, the uh, Ohio plate is still on the front of my car because in Kentucky I could put anything on the front, so I did. I had put the Ohio plate on the front and, uh, and they, of course the Kentucky plate's on the rear. So for, it's free thought coming and going either way. <laughs> and then um, One Nation Under God, that was uh, a meddling also in the mid-1950s with our once secular Pledge of Allegiance. So, Ben, when you were growing up, you would have recited a godless Pledge of Allegiance, correct? That's correct. That's how you learned it. One, right. one Nation Indivisible. Tell us why, you know, you have kind of a joke about why you chose the words, I'm God, to fight back with the, these religious slogans. The American Heritage Dictionary uh, uh, has uh, six definitions for God. And in uh, the number five definition is a, uh, a very handsome man. And my wife says I'm a very handsome man, and nobody argues with my wife. <laughs> and how long have you been married? 64 years. And Ben, I think you told us that you were uh, childhood sweethearts. Yes. Uh, I. Uh, I picked up my wife in the sixth grade. She didn't even know who I was. And uh, in the uh, eighth grade, uh, we started going together. Wow. So have you had any pushback to your license plate? Has anyone ever thumbs up or thumbs down to you on the road? Uh, no, not really. Uh, I was uh, originally, when I had the uh, Ohio plate, we were in Texas, and a lady there uh, came up to me and said, well, you're not God. And I says, well, uh, I've got a $100 bill that I've been carrying for 20 years for the first person who can prove I'm not, so you just go right ahead and prove it. And she thought for a few seconds, and she said, well, I can't prove it, but I know you're not God. I said, well, I'll keep my $100. <laughs> so, Ben, there's a lot of stereotypes, especially in the South, about atheists, and partly because many people have never knowingly met an atheist. They've met them, but they didn't know they were atheists. And there's all these stereotypes, and you look like such a lovable, grandfatherly person. Um, so, Very handsome, grandfatherly yes. person. So tell well, us, <laughs> t tell somebody who's listening who would be surprised to learn that you're an atheist, why you are an atheist. When I was about 15, I was waiting for my wife to get out of church, and I was having breakfast at a restaurant in, uh, in Cincinnati, and, and, um, and I got to thinking about Noah's Ark, and that... He drowned all the babies in the world. Why in the world would anybody want to worship a God that drowned all the babies in the world? And I think that was the moment I decided I'm not buying any of this. So what, what were you raised as? Well, uh, I was raised as, uh, as a Christian. Uh, I spent two years in a, in a religious boarding school. Um, I... Uh, my uh, our bedroom was on the third floor and the church was on the first floor and every day we went to, to morning chapel on Wednesday we went to chapel and prayer meeting and on Sunday we went five times you had overkill <laughs> that well, might... I just thought it was normal 
That might be a way to make people atheists, make them go to chapel five times in one day. <laughs> it was, uh, it was, they were good people. They were good people. So if somebody in Kentucky wants to meet God, they could just come up to your car, couldn't they? Uh, absolutely. I, I tell them I'm, I'm not the God of the Bible. I'm the God of the dictionary, <laughs> as I said before. Now, you have taken a lawsuit that shows that non-believers have a right to put whatever they want on their license plates, at least in, in your area. And I think you have said that you wish other people would do the same thing, to sort of see this idea. I, I, I think so. I just uh, seen in, in the uh, uh, free thought today that a fellow in uh, Colorado has uh, an I'm God license plate. And uh, he did it and took uh, my court case to court with him, or when he went to pick up his plate, and, uh, and they, he didn't have any trouble. He didn't even need it. There was a lady who wanted Jesus one on her license plate. Now she can get it. So I guess we could call this a license to think. That's good. right. It, uh, it's been a very interesting trip, I'll tell you. Thanks to you folks, it's just been absolutely marvelous as far as all the attention I've gotten. I've, I've been interviewed by the Washington Post and uh, uh, the Louisville Courier Journal, Fox News, the Cincinnati Enquirer, a uh, local television station came and filmed. Uh, it's, it's been interesting. <laughs> and I see that they reported that you have received our Freethinker of the Year Award because of uh -huh. your activism. That's true. And it's been covered internationally as well. Your, your case. Yes. As a matter of fact, uh, the BBC picked it up. It went around the world. And you're remaining a good activist because you have started FFRF's newest chapter there in Kentucky. Correct. It's uh, the tri-state area. It's uh, uh, Ohio, Indiana, and Kentucky. Those are right in the corner here. And, uh, and I felt that we needed to have a chapter here. And uh, we've got it together it's, with this COVID-19. It's been difficult to get uh, things organized. Well, we really admire, Ben, your bravery and, and your sense of humor. So thank you so much for what you are doing to advance free speech and free thought. Well, thank you, folks. You've done a wonderful job. Thanks again, Ben. And coming up, we are going to talk with another activist, David Williamson from Florida, about how he won his state church activism lawsuit. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist, and I'm alarmed by the intrusions of religion into our secular government. That's why I'm asking you to support the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics, working to keep state and church separate, just like our founding fathers intended. Please support the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. My name is Bill, and I'm an out-of-the-closet apatheist, meaning I don't really care what you believe, and I don't really think that you should care what I believe. I was raised in South Dakota in a strict Catholic family. I was an altar boy. I served Mass a lot of Sundays twice. We ha the, the priest gave us this little card that said, in case of accident, please call a priest. I don't really like that idea anymore since I left the church about 40 years ago. Now, if you find me, Alongside the road after an accident, please call an ambulance and an EMT. Thank you for watching Free Thought Matters. You can find more content by the Freedom From Religion Foundation at our website, ffrf.org. Follow FFRF on Facebook and you'll get notifications about all of our content, including whenever we go live on FFRF's Ask an Atheist. FFRF is also on YouTube, where all of our programs, including this show and our weekly news bites, are available to watch anytime. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you on the web. Free Thought Matters is back with our second activist guest. David Williamson is the founder and director of the Freedom From Religion Foundation's chapter the Central Florida Free Thought Community, who has worked hard to ensure that non-believers are permitted to give free thought invocations 
by local governmental meetings that open functions with prayer. David will tell us how that resulted in a five-year battle with Brevard County, Florida, which he and other plaintiffs finally settled this February. Welcome to Free Thought Matters, David. Great. Thank it's great to be with you. Uh, so, David, let's set the scene a little bit. Uh, unfortunately, many city and county governments do host prayers, and they're usually Christian to open meetings with, and this is a, a constant problem for those of us who are not religious, who believe in separation of church and state. And it's really what prompted us at the Freedom from Religion Foundation to even begin our group um, when we were complaining about prayers here in Madison, Wisconsin, and Dane County, and we were able to get them stopped or altered. But there was a Supreme Court decision, a very bad one, called Town of Greece versus Galloway in 2014 that gave the go-ahead to governments to open meetings with prayer. But there was one silver lining do you want to tell us about how that decision has prompted you and, and other non-believers around the country to seek equal access in giving free thought invocations? Absolutely. So even before the decision came down, we knew this was before the court back in 2013. And in early 2014, we decided um, that we were going to participate even if they said only clergy could do so. So one of the things we did was we made sure that we know who our, our humanist or secular clergy people were. And I became one at the time, and we rolled this out uh, immediately upon the court's decision. And one of the lines that I may not get correct is they said that even an atheist could participate in the uh, example of the town of Greece. So we took that as a call and uh, communicated with local um, boards and commissions, about 20 of them. And most of them were prompt. Um, some of them were not, and some of them were obstinate and, and uh, allowing us to conduct invocations alongside religious people. So David, how can an atheist give a prayer? Well, it is, it is fun when they introduce us as prayer givers and then we point out that we're not giving a prayer uh, or we just you know push right through that. One of the most interesting things is I'm often introduced as a member of clergy, uh, as a, a pastor, right? So they'll say, <laughs> Pastor David Williamson is here because 95% or more of the invocations given in our central Florida counties are Protestant Christian prayers. They don't even they don't even assume anybody else is there most of the time. It's just Christians. But our our invocations uh, are a secular message that's inclusive of everyone at the event. It does not invoke a god, but it does invoke the higher power uh, that you talked about. We the people, right? Those who can and do make local communities work are the people that are there. So we generally point to the people in the meeting room, not the gods and goddesses who aren't there. So you and other members of your chapter and other humanist groups have actually given invocations at about 20 counties. Is that right? Uh, so I think I didn't check before I got on, but I know we're, we're approaching about 90 invocations total with wow. about 30 different invocators uh, across a few dozen cities and about five or six counties, including others outside of our local area in Florida. And then, of course, around the country, there's been a few hundred invocations given all the way since all the way back in 2003 is the first one we've got on record. So before we talk about the censorship in Brevard County, just quickly, why are you offended when there is governmental prayer? Right. And I think there's a distinction to make there. The, the word offense is often thrown at non-believers and non-Christians. They say people are offended by a prayer. And the prayer is as inoffensive as it can be, uh, uh, other than the, the gnashing of teeth and, the, and the, uh, some of the biblical quotes that aren't quite so favorable. These aren't matters of offense regarding the theology. Uh, it's offensive when the government promotes the religion of other people or its own chosen religion. Uh, and what we want to do is the reason we do these invocations is to because they're going to happen whether we participate or not. We want to make sure the forum is open. That's the first reason. We want to educate officials and the public about who we are and why we're members of the community alongside everyone else. We want to normalize our participation and the diversity in the community. And we want to engage the local media. Certainly the story is not as as, as exciting as it was in 2014, 2015, but we still engage the media when we do this. We want to mobilize local people to get involved, and we have a social event around the invocation, either before at coffee in the morning or at a, at a, a bar or a restaurant afterwards in the evening. We make these events part of our community as opposed to just activism. So I always like to say, if why do we need to pray over terrestrial matters like sewers and liquor licenses? We think Public officials should pray on their own time and dime. But if they're going to have prayer, then our point of view should be represented well, too. Well, they say it's like it gives solemnity to the occasion. A prayer makes it a 
a more serious event. Well, right. so let's get to the nuts and bolts of this lawsuit, this federal lawsuit that went all the way up to the 11th Circuit. What happened when you and other activists approached county officials in Brevard County? So Brevard County is the space coast of Florida. It's where they, they launched the rockets and they used to launch the space shuttle. And we were honestly a little bit ignorant of how conservative it was since we're about a county and a half away from there. Uh, but it was one of the local counties. We had five in our sites originally to say, hey, you're doing a prayer. We want to participate. They voted five to zero in a couple of months after our first letter in 2014 in May. Uh, and then they had a letter from the uh, uh, Anti-Defamation League. They voted five to zero again in the fall of 2014. So that's how this all got kicked off. Yes, to deny, right, to, to basically discriminate uh, against us. And then they later on approved a policy, which which what triggered the uh, actual litigation. So, uh, so with the Freedom From Religion Foundation, ACLU, Americans United, and ACLU of Florida, tell us what happened. So it was, it was, uh, it kicked off in 2014 with our initial request, but the lawsuit was filed in July of 2015 when they had a 67-page uh, uh, policy that basically said, you are non-religious and here's why we are able to discriminate against you. The, the, the key wow. argument they made was you can have your secular invocation during the public comment period. So they were saying you're equal but you need to be separated from the rest of us. So that sounds awfully familiar. And we pointed that out too. And so did the, uh, the, the, the justices who, or the judges who actually, you know, heard the case, right? This is a separate but equal case where they said, you are, you're discriminated against, you're going into this group. And, and of course they found that at the middle district court in Orlando here to be problematic and unconstitutional. So we won in 2017 first at the district court. And then tell us what happened. So we went to the appellate court down in Miami well, so, uh, in February. So the Brevard County didn't like that conclusion and they appealed, correct? Good point. Yeah. So it was, this was a long process. I'm a little grayer and a little older after all of this. But yes, it's been a long time. But they, they did decide that they were going to appeal uh, the ruling and they pushed it to the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals where a three-judge panel heard in uh, 2019 the case and came back uh, later that year with uh, their decision. So you... You and, and there were, I think, four other plaintiffs representing humanist and free thought groups, correct? That's right. There was five individual plaintiffs and three organizations, the Space Coast Free Thought uh, Society, the Humanist Community of Brevard, and the Central Florida Free Thought Community were the organizations. And it so, was so this only works if there's people like you in a community that are willing to step up to the plate and actually deliver these invocations. Otherwise, there's no issue, is there? That's right. We have to have boots on the ground. And, and something that Andrew Seidel on your team tells me all the time is, is, is we have to have local activists to do this. When we see the news that FFRF makes in cities and counties around the country, it's because of local activists. And while we don't hear about all the victories, and we certainly don't hear about the, 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 the non-victories, I won't call them defeats, we have to have people that are willing to say something and, and speak up. And within a few years of starting our group back in 2012, we were getting about 100 inquiries and complaints a year that we handled with FFRF and other national groups. So there are significant challenges out there and people need to speak up about them or, or nothing will be done. Well, the, our local plaintiffs are absolutely essential. We cannot take those lawsuits without of the plaintiffs. And so the case wrapped up a year ago, or actually two years ago now, um, but not until 2020 did the settlement come through with the, the payment of fees, and it was significant. Uh, That's right. It was back in February of 20, uh, 2020, uh, the board uh, delayed the vote and then finally approved the settlement agreement, which covered most of the legal fees of the, of the organizations and attorneys involved, including some of your attorneys as well, as well as a small, uh, you know, some that went to the plaintiffs. So, so, so as I remember, it was about half a million. And that's, right. that's a waste of taxpayer money for Brevard County to have fought this all along. Now, my understanding is that when this decision came down saying that you can't have scheduled prayers or invocations and not let non-believers and everybody in the community participate, the Brevard County decided to drop the invocations altogether. Is that right? They did back at the initial ruling in 2017 to ensure that they weren't going to further jeopardize their case. They went to a moment of silence and they haven't looked back. 
So and, actually, and amazingly, the county's still doing you know as well as any other county without uh, the support of the prayer. <laughs> right. So I consider this really a double victory. I mean, they, the censorship was stopped because they stopped the whole thing, but you, they were told you can't censor. But we also got rid of the prayer, which is, for me, I find so aggravating to go to a public meeting as a citizen, to be told I'm supposed to rise and bow my head and show obeisance to somebody else's God just in order to participate in my democracy. So David, congratulations for your tenacity and your commitment to true American principles. We have about a minute left here. How is your group coping with your activism during the pandemic? So thanks for asking about that, because it's been a challenge for uh, local organizations, including some FFRF chapters, to keep things going. Um, you know, BCE, before the COVID era, we were having events once or twice a week from casual meetups at coffee shops around Central Florida to our invocations, and, and those were going strong, and we were probably going to cross 100 by now. But since then, we've gone online, and we've had Zoom educational events every couple of weeks, and we've had our social events. So we're still having at least an event every week, if not more often. Uh, sometimes they're small, and sometimes they're large. Wow, it's a very impressive chapter that you've been running for how many years? We started in 2012. Yeah. So forever. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us today, yeah, David. Yeah, and David, thank you so much for all your activism, but in particular, you were vital in getting this lawsuit put together and keep up those free thought invocations. Mm -hmm. Thanks, and I want to shout out to the four plaintiffs as well who were involved in this, yes. as well as the organizations and all the support we've got from the national group. So thanks to everybody. Well, thank you for watching Free Thought Matters. Because Free Thought Matters. Hi. I'm Steve Pinker. In my book, Enlightenment Now, I show that the world has become a better place as reason has been overcoming superstition and tribalism. But the values of the Enlightenment are under attack. That's why I'm a proud member of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest association of free thinkers working to keep state and church separate. Please join me in supporting the Freedom From Religion Foundation to ensure that our government is driven not by religion, but by reason.